Coming up, divine intervention leads one woman on a journey out of addiction, and a man's anger and disbelief are replaced by love and redemption. Welcome to 700 Club Canada. We're so glad that you've joined us today. You know, a couple weeks ago, I went to caves with my family here in Eastern Ontario. And it was interesting because, you know, they have these man-made lights through the caves when you're doing the tour. But at the end, she turned off, the tour guide, she turned off all the lights in the cave. And I couldn't believe how dark it was. And instantly, I turned back to look at the, the start of the tunnel because I knew knew that there would, might be some light coming through the doors. And sure enough, there was in the midst of this really dark cave, I could see the light coming through. And I thought, you know, how much more does God's light shine in our life, even in the midst of difficult seasons? And that's hope for us. Jesus' light in our life. And today, we're going to hear stories of that hope. But up first, Darren learns that joy can exist even in the midst of deep pain. I was just a tougher dude and had a short fuse. I wouldn't really consider myself an angry person, like walking around angry all the time. People had to be respectful. And if they didn't, you know, I'd take them by the throat. Darren Ham never understood why people angered him so easily. Raised in a loving home, he was constantly getting into fights as a boy. Then taking over his family's struggling sanitation business at 19 and dealing with greedy, deceitful customers only made it worse. That's when I kind of really learned uh, the dark side of people. The way they will attack you and belittle you and demean you. I felt I was right and everybody else was wrong. His volatile nature would spill into other areas of his life. In 2002, at 26 years old, Darren married Jen and started a family. As long as no one crossed him, he was fine. He never got physical with me. He mostly just was so volatile. Like he would just lose it, lose his temper. Everybody knew you could say the wrong thing to Darren and it's, it's gonna be a problem. As their family grew, Jen, who was raised Catholic, wanted to reconnect with God. She started going to church, hoping it would help their marriage. Yet Darren wanted nothing to do with Jesus, the church, or the people in it. She got home, I'd be disgusted. And I would tell her, that she's chasing the invisible man. Darren, through business, felt like the Christians were the ones being the worst to him. He did not like hypocrisy, and it really turned him off of the church. Over the years, Jen grew tired of walking on eggshells around her husband. I was very unhappy in our marriage. I definitely considered getting a divorce. So in 2009, she convinced Darren to go to marriage counseling. I was oblivious. I was so self-absorbed that I didn't recognize any issues in our marriage. I didn't see the problem and I, I did not want to change. Turned into big fights about it. After two years of counseling, Darren stopped going. A short time later, the therapist took Jen aside. He was like, look, I'm a Christian counselor and you should leave your husband, he's a caveman. And it was just really like a gut punch to me at the time because I was like, no, I need help. Jen decided to stay for their two boys, Dylan, a young teenager, and Griffin, a toddler. After the counseling, I was pretty much accepted, like I'm just gonna live this life of misery and that's just how it's gonna be. Then in January 2011, Griffin, then two years old, developed sudden breathing problems. Within days, he was hospitalized and in cardiac distress. There was little doctors could do. Sitting by Griffin's hospital bed, Darren began to hope Maybe Jesus existed after all. I was in such desperation that if there was a possibility of that being true, I would exhaust all possibilities. Four days later, doctors declared Griffin brain dead. I felt weak. I felt for the first time in my life that I wasn't, I wasn't tough enough. Jen spent most of that day holding Griffin and saying goodbye to him. When evening came, Darren mustered the strength to hold his little boy. And I squeezed his hand, and I instantly was taken to heaven. I could see Griffin. He was just so happy. I was in awe. I couldn't believe what was happening, that 
I, I thought it was over um, and, and hopeless. And here he was, fully alive and vibrant, the happiest he had ever been. Darren says Griffin started talking to someone. Darren couldn't see who it was, but somehow knew it was Jesus. Feeling God's love for the first time, Darren finally saw the truth about himself and God. I knew my sin condition. I, I knew painlessness of heaven. I knew the love of God, and I was shocked at the depth of love that he had for me, especially considering the type of brute that I was. I immediately was a believer. It was then Darren accepted that his son was in God's hands. I was very aware uh, that as much as I loved Griffin, it was uncomparable to how much God loves him and that Griffin is safe. And then I immediately was back in that hospital. Sadly, Griffin died the next day. Through grief and tears, Jen noticed for once Darren didn't lash out in anger. He was at peace. Then he told her and everyone else what he'd witnessed. Darren immediately was telling everybody, it's all about love and relationships. It's all about love and relationships. Griffin's gonna be in a good place. His anger completely gone, Darren began seeking God, reading his Bible, and going to church with his family. I could understand God's love. So as I would read the Bible, it's, it would unfold to me and my marriage was immediately healed. And I saw everything that I had put her through. And I knew her love. And I knew that I was selfish. Darren's a new man. I always say that it's like a Saul to Paul type experience with Darren. Almost two years after Griffin's death, Darren and Jen had a daughter, Elena. Darren says the reality of Christ's love has transformed his life completely. Makes me cry. The thought of his love it just brings tears to my eyes. It's, it's deeper than what can be known. There is so much to learn from Darren's story. He had created a world filled with bitterness and anger, seeing everyone, including God, as enemies. But here's the truth. Relying on others to solve our inner struggles only deepens our darkness. When we excuse our own poor behavior or blame the actions of others, it only leads us further into the shadows. The only hope you and I have is to allow the light of God's love to bring us out of hiding so that we can see life the way it really is. For Darren, it took a vision, literally a vision from God to lift the blindfold of bitterness and anger. And this might be your moment to let God do the same for you. I don't know where you're at, what you're going through, but I do know that God wants to heal you today. I wanna to encourage you to open your heart to his healing touch and let him transform your life from within. And maybe as you're watching this story or maybe one of the stories you've watched today or heard, you know you need God in a special way to transform you. You know he's your only hope. I wanna lead you in a prayer of salvation and maybe you're gonna pray this for the very first time or you're gonna pray it for the thousandth time, whatever it is. If you need God to do a miracle in your life today, I wanna to invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. So God, I acknowledge that I cannot do this on my own. I've tried, I've made a mess of my life, I've made a mess of everything around me. I've tried to fix it and I can't. And so I acknowledge today that I am lost without you. But God, I also am going to choose to believe in this moment that you are who you say you are, that you bring hope and light and life even into the darkest situation and you can transform me today. So I invite you to take over my life, my heart, my mind, Make me into the new person you want me to be, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to call us at 1-855-759-0700. We'd love to pray with you as well. We have a, a resource called Answered Prayer we'd like to send your way as well. Well, can God really know our hearts? We'll look at the answer when we return with What Does It Really Mean?
you grew up in a Christian environment or you know someone who's a Christian, you may have heard them say something like this, let God search your heart. Well, what does that mean? Well, in Psalm 139, verse 23, the psalmist says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, this verse calls each of us to a profound relationship with God, one that's rooted in trust, vulnerability, and healing. Think about it this way. When you go through airport security, you place your belongings on the conveyor belt and you step through a metal detector, ensuring that everyone around you and on the plane you're about to get on is safe. Or think about going to a doctor's office. The doctor thoroughly examines you, even though sometimes it's uncomfortable, with the aim to diagnose and treat any issues that could uh, help ensure your well-being. In both these cases, the goal is to remove anything harmful that, and to protect us. So when we ask God to search our hearts and know our anxious thoughts, we are inviting his divine examination. It's an act of trust, letting him uncover and heal what hinders our spiritual and emotional health. And trust is crucial in this process. Just as you trust the airport security and doctors, we've got to trust God's intentions. He knows already our deepest fears and those things that have hurt us. And by surrendering to him, we embrace his loving presence, knowing he has our best interest at heart. So how do we allow him to search us? Well, we can use the Bible as a mirror. We can use prayer as our 1-800 line. We can have our church family as our spiritual hospital and even see Jesus as our example. He is our light. So this divine searching isn't to condemn us, but rather to restore us. The word offensive means anything that is hurtful. So what God wants to do is remove anything that is hurtful to you and to others. And so when we say, God, search me, we're inviting him to do a deep, thorough search of our thoughts, our emotions, our spiritual being, so he can have his way and heal us today. I remember seeing the back tail end of a motorcycle, and the last thing I knew is I hit it. I came upon it, and I hit it. My first thought was fight or flight. It was authorities coming. I just wanted to get away. Shannon Baum grew up in Española, New Mexico, the heroin capital of the world. After she had her heart broken at age 15, she started using drugs and alcohol. I wanted to use it as something to forget, just get him out of my mind at that point in time. I wanted that pain to go away. She got married at 17 and brought her drug use into their young marriage. That's where we would go out and have our fun. That's what we called fun. I would deal a little bit of drugs here and there to support my own habit. As long as I was being able to go to work, I felt like my life is fine. I have control. I was so caught up in the addiction part of it, and I was so caught up in, in using that I didn't see it as a problem. But she wasn't in control. She had three children in her 20s, then ramped up her party lifestyle. I just saw that as normal. I saw that as everybody has a DWI. I'm, you know, most people have one or two on their record. What's the big deal? Uh, you know, so I still didn't want to take any responsibility for what I was doing. It wasn't my fault. You know, I was running on a beer run. I got caught. Whatever it was, everybody does it. Shannon was powerless to stop using and hid her addiction and shame. I would leave my family and I would go off and I would use by myself so that I could use, you know, the whole night. And they wouldn't see me, how really bad I was. I broke down and I started crying because I got this overwhelming feeling over me that death was around me. I just could feel it. And I knew that death was coming for me. And I thought, I'm going to die soon. And I said, God, I need your help. I can't do this. I can't get off these. I don't know what to do. I'm destroying, I'm gonna die. And I don't wanna die. I don't want to. I have my kids to live for and I need your help. Little did she know that God would answer that prayer when she was drunk and had a high-speed chase with the police that ended with her hitting a young man on his motorcycle. I woke up in the um, emergency room and I woke up with a um, handcuff to a bed. I looked up and there was a policeman standing there and he looked at me and he said, I see that you woke up and he said, well, at least you did because the kid that you hit is in the ICU fighting for his life. It hit me like a knife in the heart. I didn't even know what to do with that. I just thought what a horrible person I was. And how, how am I going to tell a mother I took 
their kid. And I remember bargaining with God, and I said, God, if you, if you help this kid and you let him survive, I said, just let him survive. I will do the rest of my life in prison. If it's in prison, that's fine. She was transferred to the local jail, where she received a phone call with news she dreaded to hear. I remember I just kind of held it there until I heard somebody on the other line. And when I heard it was my mom, I said, yeah. And she, she said, Shannon, she said, you need to go, you need to fall to your knees and you need to start thanking God because that kid you hit just walked out of the hospital with cuts and bruises and no one knows how. They're calling him a miracle. And I knew it was a miracle. I knew it was from God and I knew that he heard me. Shannon completely turned her life over to God. For the next 10 days in jail, she went through a painful detox, then suddenly felt different. All of a sudden, I felt this feeling, and I like to say it was the hand of God. He just touched me, and I felt brand new. I opened my Bible because I just wanted to thank the Lord. I just wanted to say thank you, God. And I opened this Bible. It took me to Revelation 2.10. And in Revelation 2.10, it says, do not fear, for some of you, Satan shall come and test, and some of you shall be thrown into prison for 10 days. And if you survive them 10 days, I will promise you the, the crown of life. And right there for me, that was it, because it was 10 days to the day. <laughs> you know, that scripture, and that was for me. And it was like, you know, here's your crown. You got this, you got this. Now just pick up your crown and start walking. Shannon spent over a year in prison and fervently studied God's Word, becoming an ordained minister while behind bars. There is where I really found the Lord. That's where my relationship with Him really grew because I stayed in His Word. I stayed wanting to know who He was. He gave me a lot of lessons about my anger, my bitterness, about how to forgive. Today, Shannon is the director of a homeless shelter where she shares the love of God and the power to overcome addictions. There is a way. There's a way, and his name is Jesus. And that's a big thing, is just putting that trust and that faith and knowing that with him, you can do all things. If we take on Jesus, we come from the victory. We don't go to it, we come from it. And we gotta see that is that he already won it. He conquered it. He conquered death, he conquered sin. And so that's who we have to hold on to. That's who we turn it to, it's him. Isn't it incredible that even in her most imprisoned state, physically, mentally, and spiritually, God set her completely free? That's true freedom. When we can step into the grace of God without shame, we experience the true freedom that His forgiveness brings. In fact, in Hebrews 4, 16, it says, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive His mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You know, you may not be locked in a physical jail cell, but if you feel trapped in your mind or heart today, believing it's impossible to break free from what's weighing you down, know that there is hope for you. So let's come together boldly to the throne of grace as I pray for you. God, we just pray for any person today that's watching that maybe feels, uh, maybe not in a physical jail, but maybe mentally or spiritually, emotionally, God, we just pray that they would find freedom in you for where your spirit is, there is freedom. And so God, we just uh, declare freedom over their life today in Jesus name, amen. Well, if you haven't experienced the freedom that comes from knowing Jesus, then I just invite you to open your heart to him today. Accepting Jesus as your savior is the first step to true freedom. And if you prayed that prayer today, or if you feel that this is you, then I wanna encourage you to call our prayer lines at 1-855-759-0700, and you'll get a free pamphlet entitled, A New Day That Will Help You Find Freedom in Jesus. Well, after the break, what is God's will for your life? Guest teacher, Talisi Guerra, has some sound advice if you're struggling to find the answer. 
In whatever circumstance you face, God wants you to have victory. It's not too late. Believe that God wants to do a miracle in your life today. And if you need to talk with someone who understands, all you have to do is call us at 1-855-759-0700. A prayer partner is waiting to listen and pray with you today. God's will. How many times have you pondered the question, what is God's will for my life? It's a question that so many of us spend much of our lives looking for an answer to. As believers, we know that there's this mysterious thing out there known as God's will, but we don't always seem to know what that means. Is it general or specific? Is it individual or corporate? How do I know when I found it? And what do I do if I've missed it? It's sort of this big nebulous idea just floating around out there and so many of us, it seems, feel this intense pressure to find it and get it right. So we go through life constantly asking God for a fresh revelation of his will every time we're faced with a big decision. But in doing so, I wonder if we often miss the fact that his word already reveals some simple next steps. You see, God's word has a lot to say about his will. Take 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, for example. It says a few simple things. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And there you have it, three very clear objectives for how to live that fall squarely within the will of God. Choose joy always, pray nonstop, and give thanks regardless of our circumstances. But how often do we trudge through life without giving any one of these directives a second thought? We can't rejoice when the going gets tough. I mean, that's just too hard. We forget to pray continually because life is far too busy and chaotic for that. And we don't give thanks in all circumstances because circumstances are difficult. Life is full of gray, rainy days and sometimes the last thing we wanna do in those times is express gratitude. And so we tend to gloss over the last part of that verse. You know, the part that says, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And we keep looking for a fresh revelation of God's will for our lives, searching for something more and becoming more and more anxious, overwhelmed and fearful that we might miss it. But ironically, all the while, we miss out on the next steps that God has already revealed to us. Joy, prayer, gratitude. But what if we were to embrace the directives that we've already been given? What if when we were faced with a major decision, instead of getting stressed and anxious and feeling immobilized as you wait for God to give you a clear path forward, you chose to forge ahead prayerfully with joy and gratitude? Well, you still might find yourself surrounded by uncertainty, but there's no doubt that you would be in the center of God's will. So the next time you find yourself wondering what steps God wants you to take next, go to his word. Remind yourself that pursuing his will isn't about worry, it isn't about fear. Rather, it looks something like this. Give thanks in all circumstances. Pray without ceasing. Always choose joy. I hope you are encouraged and inspired by the incredible stories of God's transformative power in the lives of ordinary people like you and I. And we can only do this with your partnership. So I want to invite you to call today and become a 700 Club Canada monthly partner. And when you do that, you'll receive a DVD and workbook entitled Biblical Answers to Today's Questions. So I want you to take a look at this and decide to become a partner with us today. CBN presents Biblical Answers to Today's Questions. I think Jesus has a very succinct answer. Join hosts Gordon Robertson and Andrew Knox as they respond to your questions. Should Christians engage in politics? Discover biblical truth to help face the challenges of today. When you call to him with your questions, he will answer you. Get your copy of Biblical Answers to Today's Questions, available now.
Well, today we've been talking about, is there hope for me? You know, and when we watch Darren and Shannon's story, sometimes it can seem like things looked hopeless. But here's the truth. Where we put our hope actually often determines our response. We can put our hope in the wrong things. We can hope for more money to fix things. We can hope uh, for better days. We can hope that this turns out a certain way. And really, a lot of times, we're putting our efforts into something that is just completely out of our control. But the shift that we saw for Darren and Shannon was really as they put their hope in Jesus. It reminds me of a story of Hannah in scripture where she was hoping for a child. She was barren and could not give birth. And that was her hope that she would have a child. And there were many days as we see in scripture for her that looked hopeless with that. But there was a day that shifted things for Hannah. And scripture says that she went to worship once more. Her situation hadn't changed. At this point, Hannah was not pregnant, and she didn't know what the future held. But Scripture says her and her family worshipped once more. What an incredible testimony to who they were putting their hope in. That's Jesus. So when our hope is in Him, there is always hope for us. Well, today we just want to pray with some of you who are asking and probably hanging on to hope in Jesus through these requests. So Dalton has asked, please remember my son in prayer. He seems to be going through some emotional stress. And Tracy says, please pray for my grandson who is addicted to alcohol and drugs. Pray for salvation and deliverance. So let's pray. God, we just lift up these individuals to you today that they would know that there is hope in you, that they are never too far from you. So we just pray for Dalton's son. We just pray for whatever he's going through, that you would bring him peace and that he would know your love. And Tracy's grandson, that uh, you would give him freedom from these addictions. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our power verse today is from Romans 15, verse 4, and it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Thank you so much for joining us today. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. On the next 700 Club Canada, one couple discovers God's way to a financial breakthrough, and an act of obedience helps one woman out of $250,000 of debt.